Good afternoon, everybody. You're very welcome to our February offering of our monthly AWARE webinar series, the title of which today is Mental Health and Disability, Minding Our Mood. And within this uh, webinar and joining, uh, joining us today for the panel uh, is Dr. Damien Lowry, Senior Counseling Psychologist at the Mater University Hospital. I'm delighted to welcome Damien along and I'm looking forward to the conversation uh, in the coming hour. Just to give you a little minute to settle down and make yourself comfortable wherever you're joining us from and to welcome you along again. Uh, if this is your first time attending the webinar or if you're a regular attendee, it's great to have you along and we anticipate that you'll uh, receive a lot of information and uh, new tips in relation to maybe uh, minding your own mood if you're joining us as someone with a disability experiencing a physical disability. So we're looking forward to the conversation, as I say. And just to say as well, folks, that if you're impacted by anything that comes up uh, in this uh, discussion this afternoon, uh, I, in my position as the Director of Services at AWARE, uh, encourage you, yeah, I'm Stephen McBride, the Director of Services at AWARE, and I encourage you to reach out for support. And that might be with a loved one or a family member or a friend, but it also might uh, be professional support uh, through a GP or perhaps even contacting our support line on 1800. 80, 48, 48. But notwithstanding that, uh, I'm just looking forward to this conversation and to introduce you to uh, Dr. Damien Lowry. And if you'd like to say a little few words about yourself and maybe a broad overview or some uh, opening remarks about the topic itself uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen, and uh, everybody at Aware, at Aware for inviting me to contribute to this series. Um, it's a genuine privilege, so thanks for that. Um, yeah, I guess where to begin, I, I, I probably should have prepared a little bit of a script in that regard, but I am um, Damien Lowry, I'm, I'm, I'm 44 years young this year, and uh, I've been working in hospital psychology for the better part of 20 years, and within that uh, experience, I've spent at least a decade working in the chronic pain uh, clinic, uh, and I've exposure to other areas of the hospital too. Uh, uh, and particularly the chronic pain clinic and, and some of those other areas, whether it's the neurology um, service or even psychiatry and, you know, those who've undergone colorectal surgeries or they have gastrointestinal conditions um, that are chronic in nature. There's a, there's a degree of disability, at least on the physical side, um, that accompanies uh, many of those presentations that are, are referred to me individually or within the context of group programs um, to help people support their own self-management of those chronic health uh, features and conditions um, uh, or indeed to provide assessments or the psychological interventions um, that may accompany some of those physical presentations. So there's quite a significant mental health burden, if I can put it that way, um, when one looks at the area and it's a broad church of an area. That was something that caused me a little bit of anxiety in preparing mentally for today's talk in the sense that when we talk about disability, we could be really talking about lots of different areas of disability. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a it's a very, very broad church. We could be talking about the mental health side. We could be talking about children in particular and the area of assessment of needs. We could be talking about individuals with an intellectual disability. We could be talking about folks who are wheelchair users. We could be talking about autism specifically. We could be talking about physical disabilities across a spectrum. Okay. Um, and I, I guess that's the spectrum within which I tend to operate um, on a professional level, at least for most of my working day. Um, and there's a backdrop to this. Sorry if I'm going a little on now, but there's a backdrop to this too. I guess it's no coincidence that I found myself in the profession of psychology. I certainly never started out uh, with the purpose or intent of, of, of being a psychologist. Physiotherapy was what was most attractive to me back in the day when I knew Stephen uh, mm. in the educational sector. Uh, and, and that, was, that was what I kind of wanted to end up doing. And it was really only because of a stroke of luck, maybe. I ended up in a college where they allowed you to have two years to find yourself, so to speak, and choose mm. courses that were of interest. And over those years, um, they didn't have a formal physiotherapy training uh, in that particular college, but they did have a psychology department. And it just, I gravitated to it. 
And in hindsight, I think why I gravitated so strongly to it is at least partly, if not significantly influenced by the fact that I've grown up in a family characterized by disability. I'm one of two siblings. And mm. as much as he wrecks my head and I wreck his, we're close brothers uh, and partners in this life. And he would be two and a half years my elder and he has a significant speech and language, an incredibly rare disability that falls into the speech and language kind of domain. Mm. Um, one of only 200 people, I think, globally to be mm. um, living with that diagnosis. So it certainly has made his life and to some extent family life um, challenged uh, mm. and, and at an individual level for him, certainly uh, he has to navigate life very differently to the rest of us. And I say the rest of us, meaning folks who may not be so afflicted. Um, and it, it just naturally probably found its way into my psyche and my, my core um, mm. uh, and my interest really in the human condition and particularly the human condition if it's got an added level or dimension of adversity to it. Uh, sure. and, and perhaps, yeah, just wanting to maybe help uh, in that space. And it's obviously a very vast space, but um, I didn't consciously go about my pursuit of psychology with all of that in mind. It's only really through the lens of hindsight that I kind of piece it together and make sense make of it. Make those so, links, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, that's probably enough about me. Yeah. Thank you for that introduction, Damien. And, and it just strikes me, I suppose, you know, the link between, uh, you know, the personal and the professional at some level anyway, you know, as you've described that. And thank you for sharing that uh, oh. personal piece of, of your life in respect of some of your own uh, family background. I suppose to, to start as broadly as possible, you know, and, and to think about, because obviously at AWARE, our mission or our um, purpose is to provide support, information and education to people uh, experiencing depression and bipolar disorder and other mood related conditions. Mm -hmm. So thinking about mood, I suppose, which is one of the central aspects of depression, the impact of depression on someone's mood. And what would you see, I suppose, um, as being the impact of, and, and obviously, as you said, and that's so helpful as an introduction, the broad church of disability and outlining that, what would you see, you know, if you were to attribute it to maybe uh, physical disability or, or maybe whatever comes to, to, to mind, the impact of, of a disability on a person's mood perspective, for potentially, I suppose? Yeah, good question and very relevant, obviously. And I'll, I'll, I'll speak relatively speaking you know to, to the area I'm most familiar with anyway um, and look you'll find statistics that vary considerably <laughs> depending mm. on who's doing the research and how they went about doing it and I guess who they asked uh, their questions to but but there's a, a relatively consistent signal um, within the hospital sector and chronic pain domain um, where you'll find between half and two thirds of individuals presenting with a chronic pain syndrome or condition of one kind or another. That's another broad church. There's many of them, mm. um, um, but which I won't necessarily get into in any great detail, but uh, uh, between half and two thirds of those individuals report clinically significant levels of depressed mood and or other mood conditions, um, which was a, surprise to me it, it now that I'm immersed in that uh, uh, field it's not surprising to me it makes more sense to me but when I first heard it I guess it took me a little bit by surprise um, and, and look there's going to be lots of nuance to that there's going to be individual circumstances are obviously very relevant that's an aggregate estimate so that's looking at the entire kind of cohort or population of, of individuals within a pain clinic setting mm. And, 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 the, and then if you drop down individually, there's going to be lots of reasons for why that might be the case. Um, you might, at least but my thinking, will always kind of gravitate, at least initially, to are we talking about uh, a physical disability that's from birth? Um, it, it, or is it something that perhaps an individual has acquired? Um, and yes. not to say one is easier or more challenging than the other, but you're going to see different aspects emerge or arise as a consequence of, for example, an acquired disability. It's going to derail an individual in the context of their life. It's going to have various ramifications, at perhaps if they're 
uh, married or in a relationship or they have children or they have people who are dependent upon them, um, it's going to have a ripple effect. Um, and sometimes those individuals that are sort of in those additional circles are, are kind of forgotten about. Uh, and I hear that message very clearly at times uh, yeah. from those who are in caring roles. Um, they're not yes. as well supported some of the time, if not a lot of the time, um, as the individuals whom they provide care to, uh, who have, uh, um, I guess, uh, limited abilities in some domain or other. Um, yes. So, so mental health uh, features are incredibly relevant. And I think that's why it's best practice for psychology as one of a number of professions to be uh, part of and for teams particularly chronic pain teams to be resourced with um, uh, those who have psychological expertise to offer um, and it's only really recently that mm. teams across this country have started to resource it's great to see um, but there has been quite an uplift only of late uh, in, in the pain clinics across Ireland, where we have a relatively small network of psychologists working in the pain field. Um, and, uh, and it's good to see that it's growing, but we're, we're still, I think, single digits, you know, and I know we're a relatively hey. small country, but it sort of speaks to, you know, how poorly resourced some of our services are and how behind the, 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 the curve we, we find ourselves being yeah. some of the time, in the, at the least in this space. Yeah, yeah, in your space, yeah. Definitely. I suppose declaring a, a shared and mutual interest, as you uh, referenced earlier about uh, our connection from the educational sector, I suppose it's important, am I right in saying at this juncture, to say that um, the individual unique worldview of any person with a disability, uh, or as you view form of disability, that subjective understanding is so important to, to mention too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I, I know I, I could go down, I could think of so many different case examples and perhaps, you know, sort of scramble my brain a little bit just to try and illustrate the differences across different case presentations. You could have 10 people present or be referred uh, to my work list for depression and the need for greater coping skills. These are phrases I kind of see on my referral letters on a routine basis. But yes. each each individual referral is going to be very uh, unique uh, at times in, 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 in what the individual needs might be. I, I sort of already mentioned the fact that it could be something very long standing or it could be something a bit more recent. Um, and like if I think of my Tuesday morning, current Tuesday morning pain management program, there are seven individuals in that group program and the range of years that they've been affected by chronic pain for one reason or another, sometimes physical injury causing a chronic pain condition. Sometimes it's something from younger or early life, but the, 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 the least amount of time someone's been living in, in that, uh, with those challenges is five years and the longest is 35 years. Um, so there's quite a bit of variance, uh, even in that sort of anecdotal one group that I'm referencing. But you're going to have people, re you know, referring to the fact that they possibly have suffered a job loss as a consequence of their disability. Maybe that introduces significant financial stress or instability and future yes. uncertainty, which may be affected uh, or, or happening at the individual level or indeed at the family level. Um, if, if, if an income is something that's being dependent upon, you know, to provide uh, for more than one individual in that family unit, um, there can be significant mental and psychological adjustments required of an individual. Um, mm. And that's easier described uh, than worked through. I, I think if that word, that word resonates very strongly with me, uh, I know the nomenclature and the kind of vocabulary that you see thrown around on letters between disciplines and colleagues here in the hospital can be quite clinical or technical sounding, but adjustment disorder is something frequently uh, 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 named or included within letters or referral mm. letters or reports that are sent to me for individuals that in, in real terms are having major difficulties adjusting to life which is now very different, markedly different from what it, life was like for them, however long ago, um, prior to the onset of something, whether that was a road traffic accident, whether that resulted in, you know, um, a, a, a permanent uh, 
spinal injury or even a limb amputation, which wouldn't be sure. uncommon. Um, uh, um, you know, life, life suddenly takes on a different feel altogether. And there's lots to get to grips with around that, not only in practical everyday terms, sure. um, but also at a psychological level. And the world moves on kind of quickly. It's mm -hmm. supportive, at least the, the, our, the nuclear support groups or networks that surround us are there for us and they want the best for us, but they kind of move on quicker than we do at an individual level. So that sure. tends to take happen over over a, a different trajectory and a trajectory I think that some people don't fully appreciate. Um, I have a person in my life, I mentioned that I have a, say, a brother with a disability um, yes. and speech and language and he uses sign language. And a little interesting kind of anecdote that I'll throw in on top of that is that um, we as a family, I, I, I was like a newborn when it happened to him, he acquired it at the age of two or three. So I was literally just, new to the world I knew no different I grew up in that space so it was all kind of standard family stuff for me but my parents certainly were scrambling very hard and I can remember moments that in hindsight where I kind of now recognize just what they were up to and um, but they were always lobbying always fighting fighting constructively but fighting like tooth and nail for services that should just mm. be routine mm. not just for my brother but for I guess any family contending with or dealing with these matters or any individual afflicted mm. in one way or another um, by life-changing circumstances. Sure. Um, and we have a major, major dearth of services and resources in place to provide. And I think that's ultimately the crux of the problem when it comes to a lot of this stuff. So anyway, just to not stray too far from the anecdote I'm sharing, which is my parents ultimately went about setting up their own unit because no one could do it better for my wow. brother than them, you know, and and they, I guess, found a person who happened to be a nun. You'd never know it if you knew her. She's one of my favorite people on the planet as much as I may not. It, the religiosity of my family life and her didn't rub off on me, I'm, I, I, I'm afraid to say. But, to add, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But uh but no, she's she's remarkable and you'd never know she was a nun. She's not preachy in any way, but she she certainly practices what she preaches. But she was she had a, a special a particular set of skills, as Liam Neeson would put it. Um, and those skills were, I guess, within the space of being able to teach and educate children who had significant special needs and uh, whether it was intellectual whether it was speech and language or whatever it was so she was ahead of the curve when other services it, that were sort of standard services at public level you know hadn't arrived at that point yet so she yes. he, spearheaded along with the support of my parents and I remember knocking on doors looking for change from neighbors and all this kind of stuff fundraising and all that just to finance wow. uh, sort of a a fledgling unit for kids and there was a good number of kids in that unit and I remember it being occupied in some kind of back room of Donnybrook Church or some sort of parish hall or something or other um, but they she taught she taught she taught my brother how to learn and this, this mm. is when he was around seven or eight or nine and that's when his education really started before that he'd been in institutions or sort of units where there was like children who were significantly affected physically and mentally and he was coming home worse than he was going to school he was coming home mimicking some of the behaviors he was seeing and he was almost mimicking facially some of the uh the the facial expressions that some of the children who had significant mental um and 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 brain deficits were, were obviously displaying in his in his company so he was he was not only was he not being helped, he was getting worse. So this yeah. was when life began for him. And I, I think family life took an, a, a different turn. So she taught him sign language. And obviously she would have known and learned more sign language at the time. But fast forward a number of years later, being a nun, she went on a mission somewhere to Kenya. She was helping the local villages and tribes um, uh, uh, drill for, for fresh water and whatever. And she was traversing you know deserts or or certainly terrain that was you know the long distances between between villages and all the rest and yes a jeep turned over and three people in the jeep died one was significantly disabled as a consequence i think spinal injury was was incurred she 
got pinned and she lost an arm as a consequence. She almost died, but she survived and she had many, many amputations in Beaumont Hospital. And it was only actually the reason it's sort of fresh in my mind is because it was only last weekend we went out for lunch um, in, in, in a local hotel. And she right. disclosed that it had been 30 years to the day on that. She didn't tell us beforehand, but it was 30 years to the day that she had been in that accident. So it was 30 years ago. But it caused a bizarre standoff between her and my brother then, because now she had an amputation. It was her right arm. She could no longer sign to him. She had prosthesis, which was an inactive prosthesis. And yes. so it, 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 it added a new kind of interesting challenge. Dynamic chapter. to their relationship. Oh, yes. Sure. Um, and so he didn't take that well. But strangely, now they're very close still now. But at the time, it was another shock that he had to sort of absorb and adjust to and overcome um, when he had enough to be kind of, kind of navigating and, and getting on with. So anyway, so. But she shared something with me, and I hope this doesn't agitate or land awkwardly with anyone who may be listening or tuning in who possibly finds themselves in a similar predicament. I don't, I, I mean nothing but relaying a, a sort of an insight that she said from her perspective subjectively, which I've kind of taken on professionally and actually has found, have found it to have benefited not only me, but some of the individuals I've happened to work with who perhaps have su suffered uh, a, phys a limb amputation, or have found themselves having to adjust to a even spinal uh, present a spinal injury. Cauda mm. equina syndrome would be something that's quite common in the pain clinic, and it's ultimately a spinal injury that can result in incontinence or uh, a foot drop and, and the need to wear leg braces and yeah. and, and ankle braces, etc., just to support one in in being able to mobilize. But she said the first year was just a whirlwind, like it didn't really register at all over the course of 12 months everyone else around her had moved on right they were like oh yeah you've been in an accident i see you're alive and well and sure like aren't you great and anything you need let us know and they didn't really mean that they just wanted to sort of you know impart something supportive and then kind of get on with whatever their own life was about um, and sure. the second year if not even spilling over into the third year that's when she really had to work hard at the psychological adjustment to her circumstances, you know, the everyday practical kind of healing, recovery, maybe, you know, getting fitted with the prosthesis and um, the hospital appointments were kind of chock-a-block really for the, her in the first year. There was lots of medical support and review. She was well held and well supported, notwithstanding kind of shortcomings in the, in the healthcare sort of s sector as well. Um, mm. But it was really when she was sort of so to speak discharged or the intervals between appointments were spaced out and now it was kind of up to her to self-manage yes. and 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 it really dawned on her that this is life now there's not that there isn't something temporary to this mm. this is permanent and how do I handle that and that's for her and others that I've worked with maybe not everybody but that's when it really hit home psychologically that's when mood really took uh uh, uh, uh i don't want to say beating but it, it 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 was hugely affected that's when the emotional struggle really began in earnest for her and that's when she needed the support on that front the most um, yes and as long as i'd been working i think she told me that about five years ago i'd been working in hospital psychology 15 years I kind of had a sense of it but sometimes if you hear something it registers it resonates and actually it kind of impacts and changes your practice and you you realize actually yeah there's there's more to that than I appreciated previously and it I like to think at least I've tried to have it enhance the way I appreciate where someone's at I guess if they're doing well as many people seem to be in the early stages I am very encouraged by that, but I'm also cognizant of the fact that this may not be the time that you need the referral to me. The, the, the healthcare professional has referred you to me because they're freaked out. They want you supported. You're actually fine. So you're not in a position where you're distressed yet. Yes. We, need to, we may need to meet or do more work later down the road as opposed to now. Um, yes. 
And that yeah. creates the uncertainty, your own predictable nature of it with this adjustment, because I'm tuning into that word, the adjustment to a disability mm -hmm. and the ongoing work that that needs that may need a psychological intervention. It may not. And it may be supported by uh, people in your social network, your family, your friends. And yet realizing that it's just like life in and of itself, that it's an ongoing kind of journey and who knows what's going to happen or how our mood is going to be impacted by the events of our life as they happen to us. Indeed, just at this juncture within the webinar um, to invite uh, people uh, as part of the, the attendance uh, to offer questions and answers, which I will be able to field uh, and, and offer to, to Damien. So. I think we're suitably warmed up now, you know, in the conversation for uh, for you all. You know, if, if you have a question that uh, I can tease out with Damien, please, I'm encouraging you to, to put it into the chat box and I'll um, uh, have a conversation or, or, or field those questions with, with Damien. Just to come back to that idea, you know, I was tuning into the uh, aspect and I suppose you touched on it in relation to your own family background. But this idea, I suppose, around disability and the carer and disability and the family member who holds that emotional space or emotional burden. And we see that uh, very prevalently in aware to do with uh, and, 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 uh, are the supporters. And we have a program, a relatives and friends program which is a four week educational program for the loved ones of people who experience depression or bipolar and uh, to, to come and attend. So, so what is your kind of sense of, of that in relation to how uh, a person with a disability can, you know, you know, the, the relationship piece, what's important in the relationship piece between the person with a disability who, uh, whatever uh, shape or form that is, and also their loved one and, and what might, be helpful in that regard, I suppose. You've 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 uh, you've you've hit me with a fantastic question, and and uh, and I'm going to hold my hands up and say I don't necessarily have the answer. I'm not sure there is sure. an answer, uh, like yes. a, a singular. But and and might I commend you guys uh, in a way for uh, developing such a program? I think that's really really good to see. I'm very. Um, glad that you've you've put in the work to do that, um, and, and 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 in saying that, this is, you know, I, I'm a little conflicted, not not in any way towards the good work that Aware are doing, but I'm a little conflicted in the sense that, you know, there's there's a there's something that sticks in my craw, I think, when I when I uh, and I and I hate to be overly critical because I empathise with those whomever they happen to be at any given time who are in government, you know, uh, and, and it's a serial sort of governance issue um, and, and I guess attitude or policy brief by the, by the state, which it's failing on in some areas. It's doing lots that are, that, that's good, but it's, it's, this is a space that's really, really problematic. Um, sure. And, and in a way that's, that the, that the, the state, I would argue, almost disowns itself of some of the responsibility it should probably be taking on because we have such a vibrant charity sector. And it's in that space where charity is like aware and indeed others do amazing work, but it's picking up the slack that shouldn't be, shouldn't need to be picked up in a way, right? Now, Interesting discussion point, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, look, and I guess just in the, on that point specifically of carers, I like, like I so, so said earlier on about my, my parents and um, my, my brother, that's just lit, one little anecdote that you will see kind of mirrored across the country uh, where those who are in caring roles know best they know best. They don't need me telling them how they need to be a better carer or what they need to do to enhance the relationship. At least that's the way I would feel, right? Very For the good. most part, they are doing uh, uh, amazing work and they know their family members more intimately than any professional recruited in to assist or help will ever know them. Um, and, and in a way, that's part of the solution, I think, is to have carers more involved with the services. But perhaps I have it the wrong way around. I think there needs mm. to be services more resourced to support carers doing the good work that they do. And now I hope I'm not out of place in saying this. I'm, I'm, I'm actually drawing from, and I need to reference him because he's an amazing character 
um, he had my vote for the Senate, Senator Tom Clonan. Um, mm. And he is one of the best and most vocal advocates for persons and people with disabilities that I've seen. There are many, many people across the country, don't get me wrong, who are doing uh, incredible work on this, on this, on this topic as well. I mm. guess he's just one that comes to mind. And even recently in the Senate chamber, he highlighted the fact that Ireland, if I have, if I heard him and understood him correctly, is the only country, the only country in the European Union um, that doesn't have a legislative basis or requirement for the state or it's it's um it's it's uh what's that word i'm looking for it's the the architecture or the appendages of the state so yeah, sure. what i'm thinking of is the hse which is the health kind of branch maybe branch of, the, of the government of, yeah. of the state and um, to to provide uh uh carers um with assistance in their caring roles. Other countries in the EU do, uh, whether that's respite, whether that's additional resources, such as a a weekly visit um, from someone who can relieve them of their duties on a regular Mm. basis so that they can plan a life outside of Mm. their caring responsibilities. Now, that struck me again as a surprise, and then not so much, (laughs) which might sound cynical, Um, And you might maybe pick up on a little bit of passion or emotion or sort of You're advocating for something, aren't you? Yeah, I guess, look, there is a a well of of feeling maybe, which comes from the family situation, comes from the professional life, comes from the frustration 44 years into my life, right? Where I'm just like, are we still failing on this? subject right you know because we have really a really poor legacy at at a state level at a national level and i'm not throwing all of the responsibility and blame onto government for that the government sets policy so it does have some it it has to take on a sizable share of the of the 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 responsibility when it comes to this legacy of failing people with with disabilities in one way or another as much as it provides help and services and supports a lot of that is is also recruited in or outsourced to the charity sector and the voluntary sector. Um, sure. So the state throws money for others to do that work, but it 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 and it's not good enough. We need to to to, to do more. And I, I'll name three or four sort of obvious examples, historical and more recent, that kind of speak to this point, which is like we had the worst history and highest rate of institutionalization back in the day, you know, and it's not long ago when we sort of disbanded the institutionalization model. And we still see those buildings which are now being repurposed um, and brought maybe into the modern world. Um, But but we, we, we were top of the class or bottom of the class, depending on how you define it, Mm. when it came to the highest rates of institutionalization. And a lot of those institutionalized were the mentally disturbed not just those who had mental health problems or mentally ill, they were those with intellectual disabilities. Like, think about it. That was said at the time of my parents accessing services for my brother, he was kind of disturbed and he was partly disturbed because of the facilities he was being put into. And and one psychiatrist, yeah. yeah, And one psychiatrist actually is on record as saying, put him in, in an institution, have another child. That's your solution, you know? And that's the 1980s. That's the 1980s. It's a long time ago, I guess, to some people, but it's not that long ago to you or I. Mm. Um, you know, so and and so that's 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 a, that that's sort of the beginnings of or the early sort of stages of of it. During the global financial crash 2009, fast forward a little bit, lots of things were cut. What was one of the first things to be cut? Disability payment. One of the first decisions they made was to cut disability payments. Now, in the grand scheme of things. That was a drop in the bucket, but it spoke to, and I know individuals and various departments and ministers were under a lot of pressure to cut back on expenditure. I think the message that sent was deplorable, deplorable, Mm. deplorable. Mm. And then think ahead to more recent times, we have a Mm -hmm. really, really problematic situation with children who have disabilities. We have this list, the assessment of needs list, They've yes. streamlined it now so that instead of a child with multiple needs, 
being assessed by a multidisciplinary team, they're assessed by one discipline who's not adequately skilled or equipped to diagnose all of the various needs. And then they get taken off this waiting list and put mm. onto the treatment waiting list and they're waiting years, mm. years. And sometimes a child who's under the age of five is put onto a waiting list for assessment or treatment. And then they start school, they're put onto a different list. And not only are they put onto that list at the same level, they're down to, to the bottom of the queue. Deplorable. Like who, who, does, who sets these policies or makes these decisions? It's not good enough. Last point, Go on. because it's salient, is what's in the news currently and has been in the last week. And I don't know all of the intricacies, but I've heard enough on the 6-1 and 9 o'clock news to know that those who were put into nursing home care over the last number of decades were taken off and deprived of their disability, disability benefit inappropriately. Mm. which is scandalous, if not criminal. So when you kind of appreciate the bigger picture and the legacy issues and the track record, which is not just historical, it's mm. ongoing, and the, and the state, for perhaps arguably legitimate or valid legal reasons, can defend its position to fight tooth and nail families clawing for fighting for services that mm. their children or family members are entitled to, including those who care for and parents are obviously carers of their children and dependents, but mm. you also have individuals who are carers fighting for services for adult members of their family or members of their community. Um, sure. And they're continuing this approach. It's, yeah, it's like if I'm to conjure my inner Eamon Dumphy, it's an absolute disgrace. Like it really, really is. It just it's it puts a really poor taste in my mouth. It yeah. makes me angry. And if you mm. if there's a if there's an emotion that stands alongside depression or anxiety and worry uh, that you see feature very regularly in the disability world, it's anger. Yes. And it's not just because of feeling hard done by or feeling like someone has, 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 there's been an injustice. You look around you and you see a world that's just functioning more easily than your world is enabling or facilitating. Yeah. Um, so it's natural that anger or frustration might, might, might occur in that context. But some of that, if not a lot of that anger, goes back to the, Point Senator Tom Clonan and others, mm -hmm. the Ombudsman for Children, Nal Mundoon. I have to give him a good shout out. He's an incredible Ombudsman and advocate for, for kids uh, yes. and those particularly with disabilities. Because, like, when you look at the EU, Ireland is differentiated from our EU counterparts yeah. by not having some of this stuff that's written into UN conventions on persons with disabilities. As you know, it's an opt in. So if we if it's optional, sure, we don't have to do it. But what does that say about our national attitude towards this area? Yeah. And that's yeah. I, I, I just feel strongly yeah. about that. Sorry, you do. And, and thanks for articulating that position, you know, and the strength of feeling you have about it, as you put it, because if you bring it back to the purpose of our discussion, too, because it's in, intrinsically linked in that way that how does you know, the overall context and the society we live in impact our mood and we can't but be impacted by societal issues that you've articulated. And for a person with a disability of whichever hue, shape or colour, whatever the disability is, uh, what's happening around it has surely an impact on a person's mood and how they mind their mood. And we've had a con contribution from a member of, of the, um, the a participant at the, at the webinar here to uh, someone disclosing that they have a diagnosis of bipolar and finding it uh, hard to manage. And I, speak, I think this speaks to stigma in some level. You know, um, do you know the question, I suppose, uh, have someone with bipolar been able to um, maintain or to uh, achieve a stable, well-paid job? And that kind of desire and what might be the obstacles and barriers put in place societally, I think is what you're speaking to that at some level may uh, intrude and preclude a person from 
maintaining that that uh, steady well, well paid job you know so I suppose we're speaking to stigma a little bit or exclusion and that that experience yeah for sure stigma is a thing uh, I know there are mental health when it, particularly when it comes to mental health we have we have a peculiar attitude towards mental health and perhaps that's a little bit of a relic or a, a I wouldn't even say residual feature because it's quite a prominent feature and um, which many will admit to having, you know, um, when it comes to mental health, but it, it could be a, an overhang from our, our institutionalization model and, 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 and general attitude towards it. And um, we prefer it when it's out of sight and it's not something that's spoken openly about. Um, I think we've only really recently developed a vocabulary for mental health um, conversations uh in i'd say the last 20 years mm. um and it's still growing or mm. developing and has a has a good way to go when it when yes. it comes to bipolar i i i think uh it, it is one of those um mental health diagnoses or classifications that tends to be considered appropriately so at times um in the more severe end of, of, of the spectrum when it comes to mental illness or mental health. I know people have preferable terms and, and, and it, yeah. it's, it's tricky to get it perfectly right for everybody. But, um, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's one thing to have a diagnosis of it. It's another thing to be treated appropriately for it. And so accessing services can be a real challenge. Yeah. Overcoming stigma is important, but then actually having access to well-resourced services is is the next hurdle and it's not a small hurdle it's a significant hurdle i read something recently i hope again it's not out too out of context or too off the mark but 40 percent of psychology posts are unfilled and you will find similar levels maybe 20 to 30 percent depending on the discipline of psychiatry posts being unfilled of occupational therapy posts being unfilled of other mental health professional posts in these services, whether it's CAMS, whether it's the adult mental health services, the primary care services uh, in our communities being unfilled. Our mental health budget spend, again, back to government and policy, is mm. half of what it has been recommended to be. Mm. Half. Mm. That's, again, another expression, another symptom of our attitude towards this. So mm. individuals who have a diagnosis of bipolar have enough to be contending with uh, without having major glaring holes and gaps in services that are mm. supposed to be in place to support them and being able to function as meaningful, valuable members of society, which they can be in theory. And, and, and by extension, I'll just say this be uh, before I go on and on and with another oh. rant, but th this kind of raises uh, a, a sort of a secondary issue then, which is this inadvertent, perhaps deliberate discrimination between those who have means and those who haven't. And um, because it's, there's a plan B if you've got some change in your pocket to be able to access private care, um, but, or the insurance cover, uh, policy to mm. cover, cover care. Um, but if you don't have the means, well, then I guess you're stuck with the public system, which is inadequate, under-resourced, chronically underfunded um, and not fit for purpose you know so like what what for all the talk we we have and go on about in terms of patient-centered care you know yeah. i think when you actually sort of stop take stock and look at what you see happening you will find good examples and i'm proud to be a part of the hospital I work for and the teams I work for the individuals you'll find amazing individuals working in the public sector whether it's in hospital care acute level care or mental health services for that matter sure. um, but it's resourcing yeah. and funding and you know as a, a policy is only so good as uh, the support it receives Jeez, subsequent I, yeah. to the policy being devised so a document can be outstanding but if it's not actually implemented, it's not worth the paper it's printed on. Mm -hmm. I, I know I've strayed a little bit from the. No, you're the, okay. No the problem. Contributor's I'm, question, I'm, but. In Damien, parent is after asking about their son who's nine and was born with a disability which affects. 
He's been saying that he hates being disabled and is getting patients. How, how would you advise to respond to that statement while acknowledging the, the feelings as, as the, the parent has, but want to focus on the positive without being dismissive? I think that was articulated very well, you know? How to best support the nine-year-old with a disability which is affecting his mobility? You know, what kind of language would you see as being helpful in that regard, perhaps? Yeah, good question. Sorry, you broke up a little bit on me there, Stephen, but I've managed to pull it up. Uh, is, does it start with this is a bit of a, a question, a specific question? But yeah, that's okay. it. Yeah. Um, uh, hate being disabled, getting very frustrated with disability. Please advise on how best to respond to the statement. Uh, nice feelings, but also want to focus on the positive without seeming dismissive of challenges. Yeah. Okay, so I'm a parent. I'm a parent to an eight year old, a five year old, and a nine week old. She could be 10 weeks. I'm actually not sure. Right. So that speaks to my my kind of mental brain fatigue or baby brain at the moment. So bear with me while I fumble my way through a hopefully semi coherent answer. I'm a parent to young kids, but I'm not a professional who works with young kids. And I realize it's almost a specialist area um, that I have little or no experience in. That being said, um, kids need honesty. They need to be spoken to frankly, clearly, and respectfully mm -hmm. uh, with the love and support that I undoubtedly assume this family and this parent will be providing in spades to, as it is. Um, we obviously have to consider what language might be appropriate for an individual, a, a young person who's at whatever age, in this instance, nine, I guess, you know, judging what my eight-year-old is capable of conversing about, that's a, a, a pretty frank and open conversation. And I think it's okay. They take cue from us too. So I think it's important that we don't signal inadvertently to them that certain areas of conversation or certain topics or certain feelings or reactions are off limits or out of bounds or to be kind of smothered. I think we need to be I guess, modeling or mirroring insofar as we can, uh, um, that it's okay to struggle with this, you yes. know, that it's okay to have reactions that are emotional and sometimes perhaps behavioral um, and frustrations that are going to manifest in one way or another. Um, all of that's going to happen. At least I'm, I'm almost assuming it's inevitable for many individuals, most individuals, um, it's, it's kind of unusual for it to not feature. Um, but but there's, there's also this overarching objective, I think, and I'm drawing a little bit from family experience here and my brother and the relationship I have with them and even a couple of other young people I know who might be wheelchair users or, or have ended up in the clinic in the adult hospital in their late teens, but have been through the kind of yeah. children's hospitals situation with scoliosis or whatever it might be um that there's purpose and meaning to their life as well you know that it's important for i like to sort of play on the word disability by saying let's dis let's not sorry let's not dis ability so there is a particular characteristic that stands aside from many other characteristics to do with this individual but some sure. of the most inspiring individuals to have ever breathed the air uh, of this planet and lived yes. have uh, that have made significant contributions have the, have been individuals with profound disabilities and um, yeah helen keller i know is a source it's of mind, major yeah. major inspiration to my brother i think he's she's probably the main one stephen hawking uh, i'm naming two kind of probably prominent or or, or standout ones joanna reardon uh, yeah no limbs no limits i think is her twitter handle <laughs> yeah she embraces it she and i i love that i love yeah. that like she almost and greta thunberg i think on the autism spectrum yeah. she she describes it as her superhero now you will find individual autistics who will not share that perspective and that is absolutely valid and acceptable as well yeah but it's trying to tap into or get an individual to tap into or a family to tap into um in spite of this you yeah. know 
what kind of life can you live? What kind of achievements can you work towards? Very helpful. Um, you know, I, I know that's maybe the overarching longer term yeah, yeah. view, um, Very good. but it's an important one. In, in relation to SSRIs, um, you know, what alternative treatment options, you know, medication for the likes of fibromyalgia, migraines, you know, and I, I know that's in the realm of the physical. And, and obviously with that, and one of our core um, kind of messages in the area of mental health is the uh, undisputable impact of physical health and mental health and that kind of symbiosis between one's mental health and their physical health and vice versa. So I suppose it's in the realm of that. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe that's a bit of a thought going into medication conversation. Yeah, that's look, maybe best served. I'm a psychologist. Us. I'm not medically trained, so I can't give any yeah. kind of like advice that's in any way authoritative when it comes to medications. All I can say about SSRIs, I used to have your classic psychology kind of anti-medication sort of sentiment or attitude back in the day. I don't have that anymore. Yeah. I'm an advocate for whatever works, whatever helps. So yes. one in three... One in three people reliably, SSRIs seem to benefit. And it's not always for depression. It can be. But I know in the pain clinic, SSRIs are frequently prescribed for pain too. Um, you know, and there's another uh, non-SSRI, an older kind of, um, oh, I forget the term for them, tricyclic antidepressant. Anyway, amitriptyline yeah. is the name of it. That's prescribed for the, 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 the triad of chronic pain. So pain... Yes neuropathic pain in particular, um, mood and sleep, because there's a bit of a sedating effect to it. So it benefits people who may have difficulty sleeping reliably consistently, you know, through the night because of pain or because of mood. So, so they're, they're appropriate, but in, I know fibromyalgia was cited as the condition, uh, sort of, uh, that, that the person posing the SSRI question, uh, um, that, that they mentioned, um, and I run fibromyalgia groups that are physiotherapy led, but psychology is parachuted in and nursing expertise is parachuted in, consultant expertise is parachuted Very in good. as well. It's a physiotherapy led program though. That is relevant. So if someone out there was able to come up with, I'm not going to say SSRI, but a pill that somehow packed inside that pill, the benefits of aerobic exercise, it would be the frontline therapeutic used it would be the best possible medication that you could administer the problem with fibromyalgia is that activity and i don't like the word exercise i prefer the word activity um is really challenging depending on various other characters yeah yeah so the extent of pain the severity of pain the physical limitations that a person experiences their age their historical mobility ability you know profile going over the ages whether they have other conditions as well um and their activity tolerance that's a key one so the lower the activity tolerance the more problematic or challenging it can be um but speaking from experience of a family member who had a diagnosis of fibromyalgia and had difficulty jogging let walking let alone jogging or anything more strenuous sure swimming was their chosen approach and over the course of two or three years their fibromyalgia didn't necessarily disappear entirely but it improved dramatically they were committed they were disciplined they had the means to go to the local swimming pool on a regular basis and it became their valued activity and nothing else got in the way of it notwithstanding exceptional circumstances very good um and the water i know it's used for the the fibro myalgic group here and, and other individuals with f- physical uh, uh, chronic pain and uh, conditions the the hydrotherapy pool is a kind of a favorite of the patients it sure. it's heated water so it warms the body which enables greater Breathing. flexibility and mobility exercises in the water that's key and um, uh, the buoyancy of it too so it takes the kind of weight that gravity imposes on your body so you can perhaps move around a little bit more easily and also the resistance of the water kind of sort of has this secondary strengthening effect if you're walking through the shallows but you know if if the local swimming pool is is a good plan b sea swimming is all the rage these days i don't know i have brave yes i need about three wetsuits on me before i can brave it Um, i'm conscious of time damien just before and i just want to field one more question to you know there's a couple that have come in you know, and a, a briefly, you know, because just to sum things up then in a minute is 
coping with uh, a recent disability, the recent uh, onset and diagnosis of a disability, and if the difficulty getting out into the community, you know, and this speaks to another societal issue around paths and roads, you know, not being great for walking and, and what kind of, yeah. if not advice, but just kind of acknowledging that. And I want to acknowledge that, you know, because we discussed that, I suppose, in our uh, pre preparatory discussion for this webinar, you know, but I suppose that's the kind of um, the environmental impact of disability, but also kind of the psychological, the link between that and the psychological aspect of coming to terms with a recent disability, if you can briefly respond to that. Thank you. Yeah, I hope I have understood it correctly, too. So a recently acquired disability uh, is part of the issue, and that's going to take some adjustment too. Uh, yes. not only in everyday practical day to day routines, behaviorally, but also psychologically. Um, but it sounds like some of that behavioral routine challenge is, is the, the, the challenge of getting out there. Um, and then facing Perhaps, some yes. hurdles or barriers out there, um, yes. which have to be navigated somehow. Uh, and and you know, ideally, one would be looking towards, if one is looking to go for a walk, are there areas um, with less uneven surfaces? Uneven surfaces increase the risk of falling, and what we don't want is a fall and a fracture and an even greater disability, etc. cetera. So um, you know, is, there, is it possible for the individual to plan uh, a, a, a journey to an area like that, whether it's the local park or some area around their locality where, you know, they have a greater run um, on, a, on a smoother surface or even a, a kind of a green space area. Um, if not, is there any way that they can problem solve around that in terms of family support, uh, exactly. partner support, lifts, um, a friend who may welcome the opportunity not only to meet up, but to share a walk at a paced uh, uh you know in a paced way um and i think sometimes these things are the hidden barriers that we have you know i've i've frequently heard individuals say i don't go for walks with my husband or my wife anymore or indeed i don't meet up with my sisters or my because i can't keep up with them and i can't do this and i can't do that yeah and rather than actually trying to now i'm not again not straying into criticism or or judgment in yeah. any way but rather than trying to sort of broach the idea that there are other alternative ways of achieving something similar, not the same thing. It doesn't have to be the hike up the mountains. It doesn't have to be, you know, the quick paced speed walk uh, down the pier or wherever one is. And um, can it be something other than that? Um, and sometimes those conversations are, they feel embarrassing. They feel overly disclosing. They feel too difficult to broach but they can be very worthwhile uh, broaching. Very and you'll learn quickly who's, yeah. who's a proper friend, who's a proper ally. And Christian ally, yeah. Uh, as, um, as you are, friend. Damien, in, in all of this, as I, as I hear you articulate from a professional, but also so passionately from a human perspective and a personal perspective, and thank you for sharing that, disclosing some aspects of your own family background, uh, which contributed so richly to this conversation. This afternoon, as you articulated the different positions that you have regarding disability and minding your mood at an individual level and how we focus on that, uh, too, at a societal level and the further work that needs to be done. And, uh, I'm sorry you haven't had the time to get through to all the questions and answers that have come through, but I really enjoyed this conversation and connecting with you at this uh, professional level and I wish you well in the work. Uh, with with the patients and the the people that you you look after and work with and provide that support to in in, in the matter hospital. So thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, and just to share, just before we wrap up, I really want to uh, promote and speak so um, encouragingly and enthusiastically about our March webinar, which is going to be reverting back to our our traditional time slot for our webinars on the Wednesday afternoon. So Wednesday the eighth of March. At 12 noon, we're going to have a, 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 a webinar on bipolar disorder and me. So we're going to have a number of people who, with the lived experience of bipolar disorder, which is a core constituency of ours at AWARE. We're here to support, educate and form people who experience depression and bipolar disorder. So we're really looking forward to this conversation. So for all the people out there present and people that in your network, family and friends, 
please uh, spread the word about this webinar or register for it on aware.ie forward slash webinars. We also ask people to take part in the survey afterwards. You'll, you'll receive an email link to that. That will give us proper feedback in relation to how to improve these webinars going forward. Thank you for your participation and for engaging so uh, actively in, in this uh, webinar and the discussion that Damien and I had over the past hour. And if you need some support about that, please reach out to a loved one, to a GP perhaps, and also to our support line, 1800 80 48 48. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon ahead.